Good afternoon, everyone, or morning, depending on where you're calling in from. Uh, I'm Jocelyn Frederick. I'm on the LEF Board of Directors, and I'm really here to moderate and present a very interesting webinar that we have here. You see it on your screen. It's a barrier to affordability, how the current property tax policies impact land development in the Met, excuse me, in the Memphis Medical District. This, as a reminder, is being recorded. I would be remiss if I didn't really give you an overview again of our um, organization. It's an honorary society and I won't read the rest. And LEF is a part of the LAI and our foundation does provide grants to the various chapters as well as academic institutions and I'm proud to say that Velma is a recipient of not just one, but two of the grants um, sponsored both by LEI LAF. Um, reminder, we do have a land economics gathering in Phoenix in October here. You'll start seeing a lot more information coming up on the events page. And then we have our LinkedIn membership as well as our other um, information so that you could actually come up, excuse me, review the videos here. Sorry for the convoluted um, introduction, but at this point, what I would like to do is really turn the presentation over to Velma. Her information has been posted on the, the site itself, so there's a lot of information about her accolades, but I'll turn it over to Velma and then she can introduce the rest of her team that has been instrumental in working on this um, white paper. Velma? Thank you so much, Jocelyn, and hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I, um, I My name is Velma Zahirovich Herbert. I go by Velma Herbert, and I am currently a, a professor in Martha and Robert Fogelman Family Chair in Sustainable Real Estate at the uh, University of Memphis. I also served this year as the president of International Real Estate Society, which is an umbrella organization that um, helps uh, sort of uh, uh, coordinate activities among regional real estate societies. <laughs> and um, my research is kind of ground, grounded in uh, consumer behavior theories and their applications in the real property markets. First things first, I would love to um, extend my uh, gratitude and sincere uh, thanks to the Lambda Alpha International and L uh, Land Econ Foundation for supporting my work. Uh, as Jocelyn mentioned, this is the second time I'm the recipient of the grant and uh, have been really fortunate to be able to um, conduct a research work that uh, you'll hear about today with their support. Um, apologies for uh, my voice. I'm recovering from COVID. And although I am at the tail end of it, uh, I think my uh, voice and coughing is still here. So I'll give it a best shot to present these today without uh, with as few interruptions as possible. Um, but I wanted to start and just tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I know most of you are members of the group. And so you uh, at some point see the reports on um, grant recipients and calls for research. Um, so I want to share with you what I do, um, the team that I have assembled here that has helped me through this project. And uh, then we'll dive into the presentation. I think I have about 30 minutes or so before we uh, open it up for questions. Uh, so um, my uh, area of research is really in urban economics, but specifically I have looked at uh, urban land use and residential property development. And to understand urban land use, I've looked specifically into historic districts, um, the entrance and availability of cultural industries in different markets and their effects on the localized housing market. I've also considered something that we call externalities in real estate. 
uh, spatially, everything we do has the effect on those that uh, surround our parcels or properties or uh, developments. And so I have looked at how, uh, at the micro level, changes in the uh, housing markets uh, affect those surrounding that uh, particular parcel. Um, so I've examined uh, what happens when the new construction comes to um area, what happens when um, different type of um, um, housing or the housing is being used for different type of activity like group homes or even nursing homes and does that change the nature or um, of the neighborhood? I've also looked at the behavioral side of the market and specifically focused on real estate agency. So I studied information asymmetry in the housing market and how real estate agents could um, perhaps bridge this divide of uh, information asymmetry between buyers and sellers. And I think this is a really interesting topic these days as we find ourselves learning a lot more about uh, those uh, fees we pay for selling houses and whether uh, this presents or represents kind of a monopolistic behavior. So I'm sure there's going to be a lot more to be said on that topic. And finally, I consider uh, building wealth through the housing or through home ownership as an extension of household finance. And I've spent a little bit of time understanding how uh, financial literacy in particular and family relationships can impact this um, home ownership, um, access to home ownership, as well as sustainability of home ownership. This particular project, I think, would fit in the first category on urban land use and residential property development, um, and it is very specific to Memphis. On this project, I was joined by uh, three co-authors. Uh, first is my colleague from the University of Memphis, also an LEI member, Dr. Mark Sunderman. Uh, Dr. Mark Sunderman is a chair of excellence, Morris Vogelman Real Estate Chair of Excellence, and uh, he has been um, um, at the University of Memphis a bit longer, and so his uh, experience and um, uh, his experience and prior research work on this local market was uh, really great in how uh, we shaped this project or it helped us shape the project. We were joined by two of our graduate students, James, Jason uh, and Fatima. Um, Jason and Fatima did majority of the work here, really, so uh, thanks should be extended to them. And I think I mentioned this before, but want to reiterate it again, that uh, I'm very grateful to get the financial support that was passed directly to Jason and Fatima in this project. And it also gave two of them the opportunity to look at how uh, learning something in the textbook can be applied to real world. So they took concepts they learned in the classroom and looked into how the, those applications of these concepts can be examined in the real world. So it gave them a really nice example of uh, marrying the practitioner side of the world with an academic side of the world. And I think that's a wonderful um, uh, way that um, LEF has been able to help us uh, move our projects along. <laughs> so without further ado, uh, here is what we were really set out to do. And notice that we wanted to talk about uh, current property tax policies and their impact on the land development in an area of Memphis called Med Memphis Medical District. We're mostly looking at whether these property tax policy that's currently in effect uh, can be viewed or is viewed as a barrier to affordability. I also added a subtitle here that says other extensions of our research, and I think you will quickly realize why that is. So as we set up to do this project, we chose the title thinking that this is mostly what the project will address. But the project evolved over time, and we have since added a couple of other interesting extensions that I would like to share with you. So to start with, what prompted us at first to even look at this is this basic notion that housing matters. 
if we were to review anecdotal evidence, uh, our own experiences in academic literature, we can um, put the studies in uh, five different categories that describe why housing matters. Housing matters for family stability and childhood outcomes. There are so many studies and I didn't cite them here, but if anybody is interested, I'd be happy to provide references on these. The studies that look into family stability and childhood outcomes say that disruptive moves affect schools and job performance. Better quality housing is actually related to better psychological um, outcomes and better educational outcomes. We know that neighborhood quality matters and matters because especially if it provides access to opportunity. <clears throat> What we found in this set of studies is that uh, relocating families to better neighborhoods can improve educational outcomes. It can improve mental health. It can improve behavioral outcomes. We learned that neighborhood revitalization is really important in terms of housing matters, because um, every time we observe any rundown or abandoned structures, they basically have a bit of a contagious effect. Those neighborhoods suffer through the externalities that we observe in the spatial market. We also know that sometimes to revitalize the neighborhood, the public investments can often be that first step needed almost like an injection, injecting the life back into the market. And again, housing matters because it has been seen as a vehicle to build a housing wealth. After all, a house is for most of us, our largest assets. And uh, finally, at the macro level, uh, housing matters because the housing as a sector contributes greatly to economic growth and stability. While we reviewed these academic studies on different factors why housing matters, the one theme that ca kept coming up is that while relocating families can improve outcomes, so can revitalizing distressed neighborhoods or basically revitalizing and in putting more into the neighborhoods where families live. This became the main theme that we wanted to carry through our project because again, we wanted to examine how can we work or what are the policies that help revitalize the neighborhood while maintaining the affordability. <clears throat> Why affordability? Because it is simply one of the biggest America's housing challenges. Um, it is uh, present for extremely low income households, but uh, many forget the affordability problems reach across all but the highest income groups. Um, there is a burden on working families. Uh, it's absolutely true that there is a shrinking rental supply. Um, public policy oftentimes put co puts constraints on production and preservation of existing housing. And all of these challenges also point to persistent home ownership gra gaps, whether we look at across racial categories or uh, ethnic minorities. So we're trying to put these th two things together. We know that housing matters, so we want to address housing, and we know that affordable housing matters, and so we want to address the affordable housing, mostly as it pertains for us to, uh, in our case, to the working families, because as you will see, the area of Memphis market that we are focusing on is really uh, not necessarily a distressed market, but rather an area where uh, a number of working households reside. Um, so I'm hoping that this brings you a bit of a, um, or gives you some sense of where we uh, grounded our project in. <clears throat> Spatially or geographically, we are focused on one urban area of the city of Memphis. Uh, this area is known as Memphis Medical District. And there is some discussion on whether the area actually includes uh, everything around St. Jude's or not, but I did include it because Memphis Medical District is uh, known as such since it centers around the Memphis medical institutions, facilities, organizations that are basically serving this core industry. 
Um, the uh, partner that we had in this project is Memphis Medical District Collaborative. It's a nonprofit that uh, came about to help facilitate some of these redevelopment project, uh, projects. And um, this area, as I said, has about 10,000, oops, one extra zero here, 10,000 residents. And the main focus is again on, um, on uh, working families. Apologies about the typo here. Uh, all right, so um, what did we do in the project? The project actually, as we proposed to LEF and the way we conducted it, had two phases. The first phase was uh, qualitative research, and uh, I think these days we see a lot more quantitative research, but we wanted to first understand how do stakeholders feel about the topic that we were researching. So we did in-depth interviews with stakeholders, and uh, really uh, the goal of this uh, first phase of the project was to understand the development process in the area, and what are the possible barriers to affordability? As I said before, we set out to study the property tax, but we didn't want to uh, narrowly focus on just the property tax if the stakeholders or developers are identifying other issues that are more pressing to them than the property tax. We really wanted the project to be of use to those um, in, the, um, in our city who can perhaps use the findings. Uh, <clears throat> so from these um, interviews, what we learned is that our stakeholders viewed barriers um, in two or could place those barriers in two different buckets. One really addressed the availability of vacant parcels or vacant land, since if you remember the image, Memphis Medical District is in a very urban part of the city. So they basically said there's a lot of issue with availability of urban parcels to even redevelop. So they talked about vacant land issues and uh, provided some um, um, solutions that could be used. And those basically included tax land foreclosures, process that's used for condemnation and blighted properties, and then zoning and building rehabilitation codes. <clears throat> and we put those kind of strategies into that bucket for vacant land development. And then uh, I would, I think, put land banks and community land trusts in that bucket as well, although they could also go in the second bucket, which was a little more uh, related to availability of financing. And so split rate taxation or these property taxes came up in that bucket. And I'll describe that uh, in just a minute. So this is kind of the, what we learned from the uh, stakeholder interviews, and I have a bit more detail to share with you. <laughs> the quantitative part of our project um, wanted to do more with a, a long-term data or longitudinal analysis. So we wanted first to understand our study area. We wanted to understand the patterns and trends in terms of population growth, population changes, as well as changes in the housing market. So to help us with that, we gathered the data from several sources. We included property data from the public tax rec records <laughs> provided by Shelby County Assessor's Office. We used parcel level permit data from Shelby County Division of Planning and Development to really understand which of these parcels uh, redevelop. We used some basic measures that help us capture local amenities or public services. So we added quality of schools using the ACT scores. We added uh, um, basic travel patterns to and from work uh, and um, some um, demographic data from American Community Survey as well as the Census Bureau. 
And finally, um, it's you can have a lot of empty parcels, but they're in the flood zones. They will never get redeveloped. Uh, we also added environmental features that can help us uh, better capture the availability of land suitable for development. So we used features like water bodies, parks, their sizes. Um, and then proximity to central business district, to railroad, greenways, uh, highways, the basic set of variables that you would find in a uh, similar study that is typically looking into development. So those were the two main components of uh, our project. I'll tell you a little bit about our study area, and then we will move into what we learned from this project. So um, Memphis is known, um, it's in uh, Western Tennessee. It's known for its rich culture, uh, her cultural heritage, historical significance, and contributions to music. Actually just finished watching both movies, Elvis and Priscilla, and uh, it's uh, quite interesting to see. Uh, but we also know that uh, Memphis doesn't get a lot of positive public image. It has struggled with poverty, vacant homes, abandoned buildings, high crime rates. Um, so we had to address that kind of elephant in the room as well during this research. Um, these challenges longitudinally looking at uh, long-term data have shown us that the city has really experienced a fairly stagnant growth. Most of the growth um, has been happening on the edge of the city it's, uh, itself. So the geographic area of the city has increased by 55%, but population by 4%, meaning that a lot of the population is suburbanizing. So this brings up this discussion of is <clears throat> urban sprawl sustainable? And again, our emphasis for the project was to look at the development within the urban areas. So this is going to present a, a challenge for us because the development that we can observe, the data points that we can get uh, occurring outside of the uh, city center. So here are some statistics for you, and I hope these images are not too blurry, but I wanted to show you the population in the last 15 years or so, median household income and poverty rate. And I've um, put these down into Memphis uh, as a city. Memphis as a city is in Shelby County and then Tennessee. So you can see that the Memphis population of Memphis has fairly been stagnant over the time, while population of Tennessee is clearly increasing. Um, median and household income, while Shelby County is kind of at par with Tennessee, the city of Memphis is much uh, below those uh, averages. And finally, if you look at it, it's not surprising, if you look at the poverty rate, the poverty rate in Memphis over time has been much larger than in um, um, Tennessee or Shelby County. So we are working in a um, challenging environment, right? City that has had a stagnant population growth growth, fairly stagnant um, household income or very little growth, and um, uh, certainly uh, um, high, relatively high poverty rates. Uh, <clears throat> so um, I want to summarize a bit about what we learned from our um, stakeholders. Uh, interviews, uh, and uh, by the way, that included the developers, people who were involved with financing real estate, as well as those in the uh, governmental and public um, services offices that were um, working with developers. Uh, so a variety of opinions here, uh, although our sample was uh, fairly small. Um, the uh, discussions, as I said, could be put into uh, two different buckets. One, I think, uh, was more uh, connected to the use and development of vacant land, availability of this vacant land. And then the other one it was access to financing. When talking about vacant land, we wanted to understand um, is there some systematic difference between uh, suburban and urban um, land parcels <clears throat> that will impact the redevelopment patterns? Because again, uh, in the last 15 years, we have observed a lot more development happening, of course, in the suburbs. 
Um, and um, if um, assembling the vacant parcels or putting the vacant parcels together in an urban environment is a challenge, how does it affect redevelopment? Does it? Is, is that a challenge in itself? Um, so through the uh, conversations with the stakeholders, I think I summarized them here and basically the trend that we have heard and it, it is very much supported by the literature. Basically, the idea is that the duration that the land remains vacant impacts neighborhood redevelopment. And this abandoned property affects the neighborhood decline even more in, because it does have negative externality effects on nearby properties. Of course, as the neighborhood declines, rent declines. As rent declines, there is an issue for the developers in terms of moving into those neighborhoods. It means that the less income will be generated by these properties. And so landlords are less likely to maintain the buildings, contributing even more to declining of the properties, but also developers are much more reluctant to uh, invest in these declining neighborhoods. An excellent study was provided by Harrison and uh, Immerglück uh, on long-term vacancy and hyper-vacant neighborhood and how they affect uh, <clears throat> uh, um, housing markets. Uh, Dan Immerglück is a uh, Georgia state and actually Austin Harrison just so happened to be local to Memphis is a professor at uh, Rhodes College who has worked with us uh, as, on the project in a way that he actually shared his uh, parcel level vacancy data with us so that we could look at which parcels uh, are um, indeed vacant and for how long. Uh, so uh, what did we learn uh, again regarding the vacant land? Um, the uh, stakeholders we talked to uh, when addressing the vacant land, um, they basically said that the, they think the main uh, reasons for the vacant land in the city were suburbanization and disinvestment. Um, interestingly enough, uh, crime was not necessarily mentioned as uh, one of the reasons why they believed the vacancy was so high. They mentioned that physical characteristics of the parcels uh, were, um, uh, were, of course, an issue, but they were less impactful than uh, simply the desire of the developers to or more profitability in other areas. Um, they did, however, mention that most parcels in the city are odd-shaped, they're small, they're detached, or they're simply in the wrong location and all together that this would hinder the uh, redevelopment of these parcels. I think actually <coughs> to help with this kind of um, uh, uh, view that parcels are small and detached or wrong locations, Memphis Medical District um, group has worked and developed a uh, booklet that uh, has an inventory of the vacant parcels in their area and suggestions of what could be redeveloped on those parcels. So there is some work on these um, done already. Uh, as I mentioned before, developers um, or our stakeholders identified several strategies that could help, like making sure that uh, properties that have not been paid taxes on for a long time uh, I uh, better managed uh, that blighted properties is uh, condemned. Uh, and of course, they saw the role for land banks and community land trusts in this process. Uh, <clears throat> We did not these do our project in the vacuum. And so when we looked at the vacant land, uh, we looked at what did the city have in their plan for uh, the type of development they wanted to see. And of course, uh, the city of Memphis has adopted a comprehensive uh, development plan in 2019. So the pandemic changed that a little bit, but um, they, uh, the idea here is to use um, mixed use um, development uh, centered around anchors in the area. And I think you can see that very well on the left-hand side image. 
uh, the anchors in the area are kind of like these blue purplish dots that represent different activities. And then there are little circles that you see uh, um, the anchor neighborhoods and the developments that happen around anchor neighborhoods. And this is really not very different from what we have seen in, a, 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 you know, um, presentations and uh, research done about walkable neighborhoods, walkable cities where the cities uh, can develop this uh, uh, like a 20 minute neighborhood. Um, <clears throat> this then uh, image to your right shows the same plan with more parcel level emphasis on uh, the areas that could be used as anchors. You will see in the medical district area, it's a lot of uh, these medical institutions. So this is what the plan uh, wanted to accomplish. Um, this is what we have learned by studying um, or looking at the data on vac vacant parcels. Uh, I, again, the image is a little bl blurry, but what I wanted to show you is uh, the vacancy. Um, so um, the red would be vacant commercial, vacant single family, vacant multifamily, green space, and then vacant industrial. You will see that the majority of vacancies in uh, South southwestern part of the city and so uh this is the part of the city that has traditionally been more disadvantaged experiences high poverty rates and um, um it is predominantly a minority neighborhood <clears throat> so a lot of vacancy uh, in the area. So development will be much more difficult to uh, keep hold or uh, accelerate in these type of neighborhoods. Um, uh, uh, there was the, the studies that we examined actually showed that the vacancy rate or the data we looked at is 16% for housing units, 10% for um, other uses, and there are 56 square miles of vacant left, uh, land that's left. Uh, and um, this is mostly due to the weak housing market. So most of that vacant land, again, was in the uh, southwest part of the city. Um, about 13% of uh, these parcels had the indicator of blight. And I think my uh, co-author here, Dr. Mark Sunderman, has done some research on these uh, blighted properties in, uh, uh, in particular. So uh, a, a huge uh, challenge is um, this vacancy, attracting developers into the neighborhoods that suffer with such vacancies. So... <laughs> Turning back to what we wanted to do is again, look at which of these uh, vacant uh, parcels actually redeveloped. So uh, speaking with uh, um, uh, stakeholders, this uh, what we heard is uh, developing affordable multifamily housing, which was the main idea again for the Memphis Medical District. And our goal to examine um, was uh, seen as a challenging because um, for the following reasons, basically the stakeholders said that the tenants tend to be lower income individuals who live in that area and they are already cost burdened. On an average, newer units cost more. And so there was a concern that bringing the newer units to the market would only add to these affordability crises, would actually bring the housing to the market, but wouldn't necessarily address the housing cost burden households. They also said that there is a uh, above average new supply uh, in that area already and negative demand. And they think that the negative demand here has been impacted by the uh, crime rates, uh, or this is again, the sentiment they've shared with us. Um, they've also suggested that the rent growth in Memphis has been mostly flat over the past years and rent changing very little. So <clears throat> to check whether these sentiments were uh, indeed correct, we examined the data uh, through um, uh, COSTAR. COSTAR is a provider of uh, commercial real estate data, and they run a lot of market analyses. One of the markets they examine is also, also a multifamily market. Um, 
So true enough, when we focused on Memphis, Midtown Memphis, actually area and East Memphis. So COSTAR does not run a report for Memphis Medical District alone, but includes a bit of a larger area. So this doesn't necessarily line up perfectly with our study area, but it's a very, very close um, uh, approximation for the area. Developers have completed um, 1,000 units in Memphis, uh, and it's above the historical annual average. Uh, and there were another 3,600 3, units under construction, and that's more than 20, uh, that it has been in 20 years. Um, they also said that a lot of work was done with uh, renovations, especially since 2010. Uh, and the renovated units exceeded the number of newly developed units. And I'll show you a permit data and you will see that actually, that actually matches what we have seen in the permit data. Okay, now what I wanted to do is look a little closer into our specific area and focus on the new development only. So what we did, as I said, we grabbed um, Shelby County permits and we mapped those permits. And this is really the uh, Memphis Medical District as described uh, by the Medical District Collaborative. So this area here. Um, uh, Costar defines again the larger market, and so this is the definition of Costar's market. So these dots represent uh, permits, <clears throat> and you will see that uh, new residential housing are going to be these orange uh, permits. You see, majority of them are happening in the suburban areas, Germantown, Collierville, and others. Um, commercial is the blue property. Uh, uh, now, notice that there is um, uh, upgrading and the new. So we're only really interested in residential new. And if you look at the uh, Memphis uh, Medical District area, you don't see a lot of orange. So there's very, uh, there is very, uh, there's not that much new specific development for specific parcel. There are lots of new units available because they'll be part of one or two developments. And that's what we see here. If you look at the new development uh, here, I, I believe that the uh, orange or, or yellow circle here is actually uh, uh, completed uh, development in the past eight quarters since I pulled this report last August. So it would have been uh, last couple of years. There was one new development and a proposed development, new development, two proposed new development with one under construction. So very few lots that have been developed into multifamily housing, making our further empirical analysis a bit more challenging. And again, I'll come to that in just a bit. Perhaps I'm taking a little too long. So let me try to go through uh, quickly that the second part of our study was focused on access to financing. Um, so we looked at the community development finance and whether that's available, um, because this type of finance can help preserve affordable housing, basically. So I'll perhaps try to go through this here uh, very quickly, but I do have to make an important point, uh, which was when we started the main goal of our study. Uh, here are the, uh, so we talked about vacant land and the availability of land for development. And then we talked about availability of financing for these developments. So these would be the two kind of sides of the same uh, uh, coin, right? Um, <clears throat> the main sentiment that we got from the developers was that as a city, I think this quote summarizes it all. We have decided to subsidize single family housing. Why? Part of this reasoning was that uh, Memphis and the Shelby County, all housing that's not single family is considered commercial real estate. So anything above four units and it's uh, considered commercial real estate for tax purposes. And so as such, it's taxed and assessed at 40% rather than 25%. So the developers have a strong incentive to develop uh, detached residential units over multifamily housing. So Memphis as a market has historically focused on single family detached homes. Um, 
as the uh, stakeholders also uh, share the sentiment that they believe that very few local actors have the willingness uh, or the capacity more than willingness necessarily to understand or <clears throat> drive the complex uh, deals um, that are part of these community development projects because very often they require putting uh, multiple sources of financing together. Uh, what do they emphasize as possible solutions? Uh, perhaps there is a bigger role that the city of Memphis and Shelby County could play, a bit of more of an um, uh, active role as either project sponsors or uh, to coordinate development. Um, they like the uh, tax increment financing and pilots, and I'll show you some projects that keep getting extension on their pilots. Um, they also would like to see... Um, because a lot of buildings in the city of Memphis and the area that we looked at are historic. So they wanna see more on state level historic tax credits and of course, property tax. Interestingly enough, um, there was very little uh, talk about how to change the property tax. Um, this commercial versus uh, residential property tax discussion, other than to say that is something that will have to be decided in Nashville. So again, it's a state level policy and our interpretation and understanding is that the local developers and stakeholders are very um, aware of that. And so they didn't necessarily think about this is in their power to affect or change at all. <clears throat> Um, <clears throat> the next part, again, is that um, these underwrite complex deals is difficult. A lot of local actors do not have local capacity to put together and underwrite these deals. There is no enough capital, uh, and um, these elements together can hinder the local institutions uh, from making these type of uh, financing decisions. Again, the emphasizing is here is that the developers perceive these as subsidizing single family housing. There was a great report done recently on the availability of community financing in Memphis. I think it was uh, published just a couple of years ago and I borrowed an image from that report right here, uh, which is probably blurry on your end. Uh, so um, these co-authors in their report on community development finance in Memphis provide a list of local and um, regional as well as national players in the market. So um, I, I don't know if this is an exhaustive list, uh, but uh, not, a, not a lot of players in this market. Um, and uh, again, borrowing from this report in their analysis of access to financing, uh, you will see that uh, the uh, average annual multifamily housing lending uh, has been fairly low in the Memphis medical district areas. Downtown area appears to be getting a, a bit more financing. <laughs> All right. So um, this so far has been uh, mostly the first part of our research, understanding the uh, stakeholders' attitudes, perceptions, and opinions. And we use that to then uh, run a longitudinal analysis of the data that I showed you along uh, side the uh, stakeholder views. Uh, but the second part of our project, what we really wanted was to run a uh, modeling land development. And um, I, I've put some literature here for you guys to uh, see where this is coming from in terms of academic papers. But what we really want is to empirically predict which parcels will be developed under the current tax structure scheme and how can we change that scheme to encourage more development. So again, some good studies here that, uh, um, that are very useful for uh, review when we are doing this work. 
Uh, to do that, we use a discrete uh, response model. It's just like a simple probability model, probability of development, and that probability of development would be a function of several different variables, individual parcel level variables. Again, this comes from the other literature we reviewed. So nothing here is novel or new. Um, model also accounts for the neighborhood spillover effect. So if something happens on a parcel A, that parcel is going to affect what's happening on the parcel B, maybe two, three years from now. So we wanted to capture that. And uh, of course, according to the theories we read, this land development is a dynamic process over space and time. And so it's really important to understand um, what else, what are other market conditions happening um, um, the, around the area. Um, <clears throat> so I, um, uh, this is the model that we wanted to do. What we originally set up to do, remember, was look at that uh, particular tax scheme and look at the affordable development in Memphis Medical District. Uh, what that meant would be to go back and look at the probability that these vacant parcels will develop based on prior activity. If you remember, in Memphis Medical District, we only had several observations that developed over time. So it became very challenging to estimate a model for the multifamily development because we simply did not have enough data, enough data points to train our data to run a predictive model. Oops, sorry, I wanted to go back here. And here are some examples that made it even more complicated. For those of you on the call or on the webinar who are from Memphis, you will know that, um, for example, this Dearman building was uh, originally proposed to be developed into a multifamily housing. But then nothing happened. A year or two later, the new design has been approved to turn it into a Holiday Inn Express. So that kind of a hotel, so that kind of observation now suddenly disappears from our data set. We also know that some of the developments that were going on were taking longer or um, would scale down basically in the size of the development. So here's one that was uh, scaled down and uh, received the pilot extension. So again, using this data point in our model made it difficult. So an alternative for us was to actually look at what other studies do uh, is turn to residential units and look at which of these parcels build as a residential unit. So kind of like inverse probability, if not multifamily, which ones build as a residential unit. So we also got the data from um, Memphis Association of Realtors that actually has all of the sales of the housing units. And when we did that, if we consider the event um, permit applied for a new construction, we can actually we see then now the relevant parcels that were rebuilt, if, especially if we are concerned with two years prior and post to look at into the impact of the particular development. So I'm going to stop here and uh, kind of summarize what this means for us. What this means for us is that um, Although we want to model land development in terms of multifamily housing, the data challenges made that, that uh, difficult. Uh, and we have to um, turn our estimation to look a lot more like uh, what other studies have done um, and uh, focus on actually probability of building a residential um, detached unit and then interpret that perhaps as an uh, inverse of uh, having it being a, um, a multifamily unit. So I think I'm almost at the end of my time here. I'll stop here and uh, open the floor for any questions. See some in the chat box, but uh, I'll see if Jocelyn has uh, kept track of what they are. Thank you all. Thank you, Velma. Um, there is one that you've actually ended on, and it is a question that's in the middle of the chat box. And this is, can zoning regulations and incentive encourage infill development? Removing some of the barriers and such as the smaller parcels, assembling parcels, reducing parking requirements. Um, what are your thoughts on that? 
Uh, yeah, absolutely. That uh, the zoning regulation was actually one of the strategies proposed uh, um, as a possible uh, uh, solution. I think it's right in the beginning, zoning and building rehabilitation codes. It was mentioned by our stakeholders. I believe they can work in in our case, in Memphis specific case. That didn't seem to be the concern of the local parties. It is possible that they didn't have issue with that or that the other issues were much more pressing. But I think we have seen a lot of literature that uh, this is absolutely possible. If I can recall correctly, um, um, a lot of Pacific West states have removed zoning requirements on detached uh, uh, units that helped uh, with uh, a, a um, uh, affordability. I have a paper with Jeffrey Robert at Vir Virginia Tech in which we look at the up zoning. So the change from single to two unit uh, residential development in terms of parcels. Uh, is, is, I think some of these are very vi uh, viable strategies. It didn't come up as the main concern in our area. Okay. Um, some of these other questions are really clarifications on your slide deck. Um, what are the characteristics of the 3,600 units that are currently under development? Are they owner rentals, single family, multifamily? Multifamily. Multifamily. These are multifamily in the entire uh, Memphis market as defined by COSTAR. So this would be, and I believe that the, this report I pulled was from August. Uh, so this would be a, uh, um, a market that's a bit bigger than uh, what we defined as our main study area, Memphis Medical District. Uh, and I see the comment on split rate tax. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, uh, we are very well aware of the research coming out on Pennsylvania. And I think the idea that our, um, our uh, partners in Memphis Medical District had came from Pennsylvania cities and they really wanted us to look into whether relaxing this tax constraint would uh, indeed increase building permits as a result. So that was again, the main, um, the main question how this project came about. The mm -hmm. state law does not allow for split rate tax. No, not right now, which I think was why the response we got uh, as, oh, this is something that will have to be discussed in Nashville, uh, was the reason that our interviewers did not engage in a lot of discussion about it. I think they understood that their limitation to affect this decision uh, is uh, is pretty strong, you know, pretty high, that this is what it is and will have to be decided in Nashville was pretty much the response we got. Um, there, there's one question I do want to get to before getting to some of the other clarifications. And it is about the current challenges in the commercial real estate and how that impacts residential properties. And as a takeaway, what I've learned from you is the definition of commercial here really varies by jurisdiction since Memphis puts um, four units or more as a commercial real estate versus an office. So. Um, your thoughts on some of this, or is this a um, topic for another study? Perhaps topic for another study. I think we really narrowly focused on, on, on this one little neighborhood for us to better understand really what is going on. But uh, but I think there there, there are some um, and, and I want to I don't want to uh, misquote uh, here, but I believe there's some uh, talk about uh, Illinois or Chicago area county or something, uh, Detroit. I, I I will forget now. COVID brain, let's call it COVID brain, that is also looking into changing this stock structure a bit to see how uh, it affects the development. So, sorry. Okay. Um, I, I do want to put a plug in for those of you that were not at Barcelona. There was a very interesting study done for the rejuvenation of the vacant industrial lands along the river into affordable mixed-use commercial real estate development. 
So some of that information is probably within the website if you want to search for that. Mm -hmm. And then um, final just clarification is population increase of 4%, area increase of 55%. Um, I, I believe that was really for the medical I, district itself versus the... Um, uh, that was state. actually for the metro area for the uh, Memphis metro area. So most of the growth that uh, we've seen has been happening on the outskirts. Um. <clears throat> okay, let's see. Um, and I think we did mention this. Um, Tennessee does not allow for split rate taxes. No. Um, I'll no. do a final call for questions. Um, Okay, well, um, none showing up. I want to thank all of you for a very um, robust discussion and presentation. And as uh, mentioned earlier, we will be posting this on the LAI website. So thank you very much. Thank you all for coming. And again, thank you to my um, team members for uh, helping do the work on this project. I very grateful for LEF for their um, funding and um, support of our research. Oh, hold on. There is a last minute question. Any indication, um, this is doing a um, forecast though, of how difficult it would be to change state law to allow for a, a split rate tax. I wonder if there are any public policy people here who could help. Uh, I I actually was quite uh, surprised at how reluctant our uh, participants were to even discuss these. So that made me believe that they really did not want to be uh, on the record saying anything. Uh, so yeah, I don't know. I, I, I really do not know. It's uh, unfortunately not part of my research agenda. Dr. Sunderman, who is a contributing author on here, does a lot more research with property taxation. And I know that he and um, Jason have another project uh, happening right now. Uh, I don't know if in that particular project they're looking at the tax issue specifically or not. I'm not sure. So sorry, not able to answer that very well. Okay, well, again, thank you very much. And thank you all for joining us. Bye, everybody.